Hello everyone, and welcome to a new video. Today I'll be showing you my two most recent attempts at making a late 1860s style hoop skirt, one of which was vastly more successful than the other. But I learned from my mistakes on the first attempt, as horrible as it ended up being, and I thought you might be able to learn from it too. So I'll be sharing the process of constructing both hoop skirts in this video and showing you how they both turned out. The inspiration for these hoop skirts came from English Woman's Clothing in the 19th Century by C. Willett Cunnington. A fashion plate found on page 250 shows a drawing of a hoop skirt described as a crinoline of scarlet flannel from 1869. The hoops appear to be mounted on a strip of fabric, which is suspended by straps that hang from a bum pad. If you didn't know, bum pads were often sewn to hoop skirts from this era to force them backward and exaggerate the elliptical shape. So having a hoop skirt where that is a major part of the design really caught my eye, and I foolishly thought I could make something similar quite quickly. The fabric I bought for this is a grey polka dot quilting cotton, and instead of making fabric straps, because really, how important can those be, I planned on using twill tape. I also had this ruffled satin ribbon which I planned on using for boning channels, and a big bag of polyfill for stuffing the padded portion. This helpfully says how many stuffed toys and pillows you can make for a single bag, but not how many 19th century bum pads, so not very helpful packaging at all, but I figured one bag would be plenty. Lastly, I had hoop steel, and with my materials acquired I drew up a pattern, which looked a bit like this and got started. I actually only drafted a pattern for the padded portion and decided the bottom portion could be shaped by adjusting the overlap of the hoops to make them taper to a smaller shape at the top, instead of making a pattern that had any real shape to it, which would be more work. So the bottom portion is just a 20 inch by 122 inch rectangle that I cut from the gray fabric and you can see me doing that here. I also cut out two pieces following my bum pad pattern, which was the line on the fold of the fabric prior to cutting. Then I began transferring the channel markings onto the fabric and the fabric was sheer enough that I could lay my pattern underneath it and trace the markings onto the fabric using a pencil. And I only needed to mark these on one of the layers of fabric. Then I cut my ribbon into 36 inch long strips. The ribbon was positioned and pinned between notches that I clipped into the fabric that will form the bum pad. Then I pinned the remaining bum pad piece over top the first, so the right sides were together and the edges were all aligned. The top edges of the ribbon should be trapped between these two pieces. I sewed these layers together around the outer edge with a half inch seam allowance, and in doing this I'm securing all of those pieces of ribbon in place. Now the fabric was turned right side out and ironed flat. With the marked side facing up, I began pinning the two layers of fabric together once again, just to prevent them from shifting around or puckering when I sew across the markings, which was the next step, and you can see me doing that in this footage. Once my markings were sewn across, I ironed the material once again, and now it's time to pull out our big old bag of polyfill. I'm pulling a bit of polyfill out at a time and using my fingers, and weirdly a screwdriver, to push it in between the layers of fabric and into each padding channel. This process was repeated until every channel was firmly filled with polyfill. Once I finished this, I put it on my dress form, and the shape was all wrong. It was too wide and just too big in general, so it was kind of flopping over on itself. Some people might start over at this point, but I thought the answer was clearly adding more padding, so I decided to cut out two smaller bum pad patterns from two layers of fabric. The right sides of these pieces were pinned together, then I sewed around the edges with a half inch allowance. Like with the now padded bum pad, these were turned right side out and ironed. Then it was also stuffed with polyfill, and I pinned the top edge closed to prevent said polyfill from spilling out. I repeated this with the other bum pad option, which was slightly smaller, and after another fit test on my dress form, I decided I liked the larger version better. So I sewed it to the original bum pad, and I'm just realizing now how many times I've said bum pad in this video and we're not even halfway through, but anyway. <laughs> now the shape was better, not perfect, but better, and this is what it looked like from the top and from the bottom. Now it needed a waistband, which is just a rectangle cut to the length of my waist and twice as wide as I want the finished one to be, plus an extra inch of seam allowance. I lined the centers of the waistband with the center of the pad, then pinned them together outward from that point with the edges aligned and the right sides facing each other. I also pinned more strips of grosgrain ribbon between the layers right where the pad ends at the front. These were sewn together with a half inch seam allowance, and it was really rippled and awful since the padded portion was putting so much tension on it, so I decided to try and save the appearance of the waistband with band roll, which is a waistband stiffening. But it's supposed to be fused on, not sewn, and it's supposed to be applied prior to sewing the waistband on. So this was really just a last-ditch attempt to make it look better, not a method I would recommend at all. 
And it didn't even really work, but I tried to save this the best I could by wrapping the fabric over the band roll and top stitching across the top edge. Then I folded the raw edge on the interior inward by a half inch and pinned it to cover the raw edges. At this point I was thinking to myself, it looks terrible, but I'm going to hand sew this edge down and maybe that will magically fix it. But it was so rippled that I had to put a lot of tension on the waistband to get it smooth while sewing, so I don't have any footage of the actual sewing. But here it is after being sewn. If you're wondering what the icing on this crabby cake is, the waistband was too small. So instead of having a button closure, since I couldn't overlap the fabric at all, since it was too small, I decided I would close it with eyelets instead. So I used a die and a hammer and a block of wood to make holes for said eyelets. Then I embroidered around those holes until the raw edges were completely covered with thread. Okay, now it is time for the skirt portion that will hold the hoops. As I said earlier, this is just a rectangle. A rectangle that will be sewn into a loop. But first I'm marking lines two inches away from both long edges. And then I'm pinning the short ends of the rectangle together with the wrong sides facing each other. Then we're sewn together with a half inch seam allowance. Then the seam allowance is trimmed down to a quarter inch and ironed flat. I folded the fabric on the seam line and pressed it once more so the right sides were facing each other, then pinned near the seam line to secure the layers together. Now the fabric is seamed together at this point once again with a half inch allowance that neatly encases and finishes the raw edge. I pressed the seam allowance to make sure it wasn't puckered, then began turning the long edges of the fabric outward so they met the pencil markings on the right side of the fabric. These were pressed in place until both edges were turned outward by an even inch. Now I could measure away from the semi-finished edges and mark the placement for the two centermost boning channels. And once again, these were marked with pencil on the right side of the fabric. And this is where my ruffled satin ribbon came into play. This will serve as boning casing and was first aligned with the top and bottom edges of the fabric. Then I sewed it down, creating boning channels on either edge of the material that start about a quarter inch away from the actual edge of the fabric. In this process, the ribbon is also top stitched over the portions turned outward, thus finishing the top and bottom edges. And it's important during this process to overlap the ribbon by a few inches and to turn the cut edge inward prior to sewing across it so it doesn't fray over time. I also lined the ribbon with the pencil markings towards the center of the fabric, then sewed the edges of it down once again, creating two more boning channels. Now it's time for the boning, which is not as sexy as it sounds. In fact, it is actually kind of a nightmare. This was a tight coil of boning, and once I started unraveling it, it quickly uncoiled itself and snapped in a whole bunch of different directions with a surprising amount of force. It actually knocked a glass ornament off my Christmas tree, which then shattered all over the floor. Which looking back might have been an omen about how this project was going to end up. But anyway, I hate hoop steel a lot, but I measured and cut it into even lengths that were slightly larger than the rectangle I cut for the bottom portion of the skirt. I also clipped the corners of each bone so they were less pointy and more rounded. This way, they won't break free from their channels and potentially stab you or go on ornament breaking adventures. Now the bones can be fed into the channels, which is a hard process to film, so I'm going to super speed it up and then switch to photos showing the final stages of constructing this. So, all the bones were added, then I roughly pinned the grain ribbon to the topmost bone, and it looked like this. No real shape to it, which is expected given that this pattern is just a rectangle. Then I overlapped the bones inside their casing until the circumference of the skirt got smaller towards the topmost bone. I also bent the bones to get more of an elliptical shape because it did not take that on on its own. I had to play a lot with the ribbon too. I adjusted it a lot and ended up adding more extending from the center back of the waistband and knotting it together, and doing a bunch of crap to try and get it to hang nicely. None of which really worked. And it was still a big ol' fail. The front had a weird boxy shape since the boning needed to be bent to create it. And I couldn't get the bones to taper evenly, so the shape in general was weird. And the ribbon wasn't wide enough to give adequate support, so I couldn't raise the ribbon enough in the back to prevent it from tilting forward. The bum pad is also really wrong in shape too. You can kind of see how it's too big and flattened on the center and flaring out at the sides. The back of the bones were bent too to try and create more of an angular shape, and from this angle you can see how wacky the ribbon was arranged to get any semblance of support. And the whole thing was just too big in general, except for that stupid waistband. I hated it, and it's my fault since I rushed into it without making mock-ups of the pad or drafting something to shape the bottom portion, or making wider supports. I think my laziness shows in how crappy the end result is, and I would never ever use this as a foundation for a dress. Not ever. So I hit the books in an attempt to reference other hoop skirt patterns when making my second attempt. This time, the book in question is Reconstruction Era Fashions by Francis Grimble. And you know what I found in this book? A pattern and description for the exact hoop skirt I had seen an image of in a completely different book. I'm not 
not sure what the odds of that are, but I was kind of shocked and kind of thrilled. So I got back to work, starting by tracing their pattern onto a new sheet of paper. Their pattern is one quarter scale, so I labeled the full size measurements on my traced copy. I also drew boxes around each piece, then labeled the dimensions of those too. When I was scaling these up, I drew the boxes first, then freehanded the shapes of the pattern pieces inside of them, with the help of a ruler, to make sure things were close to being correct. And in doing this, I realized the pattern was going to make a very small hoop skirt, so I added an extra inch here and there, and seam allowance, adding that is super important too. Their pattern was very different than the one I originally came up with. The bottom portion of the skirt is much more shapely, and the bum pad portion is really small by comparison. Once my pattern was finished, I pinned it to a floral cotton fabric and cut it out. I'm I'm also notching the fabric at the points where the straps attach, which is another thing I made sure to mark on my pattern. After everything was cut and notched, I began assembly, starting once again with the bum pad. I pinned my fabric over top of the pattern, then used a pencil to transfer the markings on the pattern to the material. Like before, the fabric was thin enough that I could easily trace the markings from the pattern underneath it. And you'll notice that the channels I'm marking are much closer together this time, since the pad itself is so much smaller. But before I could really assemble the pad, I needed to assemble the straps that would be seamed to it. Now on the original, the straps are two separate pieces, one extending up from the skirt and one hanging down from the pad. They are secure together with a buckle that allows the skirt length to be adjusted. But since I'm the only person who will be wearing this, and I'm not planning to grow or shrink anytime soon, I decided to ignore the complexity that dealing with a buckle would come with and instead draft my own strap pattern. This pattern tapers from one and a half inches at the top to three inches at the bottom, and these should offer the same amount of support that the straps on the original provided. There are six supports on the skirt, so I'm using this pattern to cut 12 copies from fabric, since each support will consist of two layers of material sewn together. After after they were all cut out, I pinned the pieces together two at a time with the right sides facing each other. Now I'm sewing the long edges together with a half inch allowance. All of these were turned right side out, then ironed with the edges even, leaving me as six tapered strips of fabric with neatly finished edges, except for the short ends, but those will be tucked away later on. Now I'm pinning the narrow end of each support piece between the notches on the right side of one of the bum pad pieces. And I'm pinning the remaining bum pad piece on top of that with the right sides facing each other and the edges even. I sewed all of this together with a half inch allowance following the curved outer edge of the bum pad. I turned the right side out then removed all the pins and gave it a thorough ironing. I'm pinning the layers together once again but this time just to prevent the fabric from shifting around. Then taking it back to my sewing machine and sewing across all the markings on the bum pad creating channels for boning and padding. Now according to the pattern and pattern description, this pad was less of a pad and more of a bustle bone with steel, but I didn't think there would be enough tension on the bones to create a nice shape, so I decided to alternate boned and padded channels. So I pulled the polyfill back out and attempted to stuff the channels, but these were much narrower than the ones in my first attempt and much harder to fill, even with the help of a skewer. After a lot of struggling, I decided to try stuffing it with strips of quilt batting instead. These were much easier to grip onto and push in place with the skewer, and the process was much faster while providing a similar result. With half of the channel stuffed, I filled the remaining ones with boning. I sewed across the top edge of the pad to prevent the boning and padding from escaping. Then I drafted a pattern for the waistband, which is just a rectangle, and cut it out from matching cotton. I marked a line down the center of the waistband, then ironed one edge inward until it touched that line. I pinned the non-folded edge to the top edge of the pad with the right sides facing each other. And like before, I lined the centers first, then pinned outward from that point, leaving several inches of waistband extending past either end of the pad. I sewed the waistband on with a 3 quarter inch seam allowance, then ironed the seam thoroughly. I folded each short end of the waistband in half, then pinned and sewed across both ends. I clipped excess material from the points of each corner, then turned the waistband right side out. The folded edge of the waistband was pinned to cover the stitch line where the other edge was seamed on. The portion of the long edge that extended past the pad was folded inward by three quarters of an inch, then the folded edges were aligned and pinned together as well. I whip stitched all the way along the pinned portions to secure the waistband neatly in place. Then, since the waistband was actually long enough this time, I sewed a buttonhole into one end of the waistband. I did this by machine since I'm lazy and my hand-sewn buttonholes are still ugly. And that finished the upper portion, so I could now work on the skirt. And the first step was pinning all these skirt pieces together with the wrong sides facing each other. These pieces were then seamed together with a half inch allowance. The excess seam allowance was trimmed, the seams pressed, and pinned once again with the right sides facing each other. Then they were sewn once again, resulting in tidy French seams. 
With the pieces sewn together, it was time to hem the edges. I did this by marking a line two inches away from each edge. Then I turned the edges up to meet these lines and pressed them in place. This created a neat one inch hem around both edges. And don't worry about the raw edges. Like with my first attempt, that will be covered with bone encasing later on. In the meantime, I got out another ruler and another marking pen and marked lines three inches away from each now folded edge. These lines indicate the innermost bone encasing placement. Now it's time to sew on the bone encasing, and I'm once again using ribbon with ruffled edges. I had just enough of it for both of these attempts. I sewed the inner channels first. I did this just by aligning the top of the ribbon with the marked line, then sewing as close to the edges of the flat portion of the ribbon as I could to secure it in place. And like with the first attempt, I'm overlapping the ribbon by a few inches and turning the cut edge inward before finishing it off. But this time, I'm making sure to sew the lower edge on first since the skirt tapers to be wider near the hem. It's much easier to sew ribbon onto the widest point and ease the top edge to be smaller than the reverse, which is pretty much impossible. With the inner boning channel sewn, I also stitched ribbon casing to the bottom edge. However, when sewing it to the top edge, I didn't sew down the edge closest to the top, just the bottom edge. That's because I'm going to encase the bands that support the upper portion within this channel. So I don't want it sewn closed just yet. Here you can see me pinning the bottom ends of the bands between the notches on the top edge of the skirt. And here you can see a bone I cut to be 12 inches longer than the bottom edge of the skirt. I overlapped the ends, then secured them together with binder clips. Now I'm using more binder clips to secure the hoop to the bottom edge of the skirt. I repeated this process with the slightly smaller hoop too, which was clipped to the top edge of the skirt. Now I could put the hoop skirt on my dress form and get a good idea of the length. I repinned the band several times until the skirt was the right length and the hem hung evenly. Then I removed the temporary hoops and labeled the band so I wouldn't get confused when trimming them, which was the next step. I used a ruler to measure how much it needed to be trimmed from each band, then trimmed the band and tucked it between the ribbon and the cotton fabric, and pinned it in place. I repeated this for the remaining bands on that side, then used the measurements from the first side as the guide from trimming the bands on the other remaining side to ensure that they are symmetrical. And with all the bands trimmed down and pinned, now I could stitch down the top edge of the ribbon slash bone encasing, which also stitched the bands in place. All that was left was the hardest part to document, which is cutting the hoop steel down to be slightly larger than each channel. And I found the measurement of each channel by using a measuring tape to measure them. Truly riveting stuff. Then I measured out the boning, cut it, and cut the corners so they were more rounded and less jabby. And now the boning could be inserted in each channel, and once again I don't have a lot of usable footage of this process, but I'm sure you get the idea. Here's how it looked with the boning, and honestly I think this is a pretty cute shape, but it does have almost as much volume in the front as in the back, and an elliptical shape is more historically accurate and what I was personally going for. And a way to achieve that shape is by weighing the front of the skirt, which forces it backwards, providing more volume to the back. And to do this, you need small weights. I know people often use washers and sandbags and all sorts of things, but I'm using half pound weighted bars from a set of weighted exercise bands. A link where I bought these down below. For 15 bucks, you can get a 10 pound set with enough weights for several hoop skirts. The weight of these bands are meant to be adjustable, so a Velcro strip is all that secures the bars in place, making them easy to remove and use for your hoop skirt adventures. The downside of these weights is that you can't sew through them to secure them to the skirt, since they are metal bars. So I made little bags for them. The short ends were ironed inward by a half inch or so. Then I'm folding the rectangles in half so the wrong sides are facing each other and the folded six inch long edges are aligned. Now I'm sewing across the really short edges with a half inch allowance. I didn't bother clipping the corners or doing anything fancy to make these pouches look super precise. I just turned them right side out and used a point turner to make the corners look slightly sharper. Now the weights could be put in their pouches and the folded edges were pinned together. I sewed a quarter inch away from the top edge of each pouch, then went back and sewed an inch away from the top edge as well. I pinned these pouches to sit parallel to each other and just under the front straps. They were pinned and eventually sewn to the bone encasing, which is stronger than the cotton fabric. These really changed the shape of the skirt and flattened the front significantly while providing lots more volume to the back. 
I didn't film sewing the weights on since it was at an awkward angle, but I used several tacking stitches at the uppermost corners of each pouch. Here's how the finished skirt looked from the interior. And here are a whole bunch of exterior shots. And I can definitely say that this is superior to my first attempt in shape, construction, and literally everything else. It's just much, much better. And it took pretty much the same amount of time to make. So it just goes to show that investing time into drafting a pattern or using a reputable pattern or testing a pattern prior to starting on something is really worthwhile. You'll often get a better result and probably save time in the end because you, hopefully, won't have to remake it or invest time into trying to fix it. And that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed my hoop skirt adventures and failures more than I did. And if you did, giving this video a like and a comment really helps me out. On that note, thank you so much for watching. I will be back with another video next Friday and talk to all of you then.